Hello, everyone. We will begin in a few minutes. Like she was really in danger. Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our NIM 2023 workshop titled Root and STEM. My name is Megan Fitchkowski, and I'm a licensed engineer in the province of Ontario. This evening, I'm planning on taking you on a journey to explore an alternative viewpoint in engineering profession. I hope that you enjoy the experience. We will begin with a mini icebreaker activity as an intro to the topic. From there, we'll explore how engineering is defined and how we may choose to improve it. Throughout the workshop, I will be posing many rhetorical questions merely to encourage you to think beyond the topic. First and foremost, I would like to begin by acknowledging the indigenous peoples of the land that we are on today. While we meet today on a virtual platform, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the land, which we each call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and to improve our own understanding of local indigenous peoples and their cultures. Please join me in a moment of reflection to acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and to consider how we can each, in our own way, move forward in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Here with us today, we have many EITs and professional engineers. We also have a few uh, engineering students and young professionals from other fields. I hope that you can all take away a meaningful message uh, from this workshop as it pertains to your respective fields. So let's start by breaking the ice. <laughs> Uh, if you can, please go to Mentimeter and put the code you see on the screen uh, up here, the 37932997. And we want to explore a little bit about what engineering means to you. What do you think engineers do? Since um, PowerPoint lags, uh, lags a little bit, I go directly to Mentimeter. So I can see your responses right there. I'll just give you a few minutes to everyone to kind of find their way. Awesome. And you can submit as many responses as you want. Design, analyze, manage. What else can we think of? Yes, solve problems. Create, lead, define problems, yes. Yes, I love it. Resolve conflict. That's awesome. Math, yes. <laughs> Share information. Very true. Yep. Let's give it 40 more seconds. <laughs> Very cool. Yes, validation is a huge part of it. Verification, yes. Cost, stress, yes. 
I can I can I can really agree with that one. <laughs> Observations, yes, very true. Okay, amazing. All right. Okay, we can move on, but feel free to submit your answers and I will share um the final results with everybody afterwards. Um oh Look at that, our PowerPoint actually worked. <laughs> All right, so as you can see, we typically view engineering as what we do. But what if I propose to you today an alternative definition? What if I say to you, engineering is not what you do, but a mindset you have? I was told this when I was an engineering intern back in 2013 by my boss at the time. And I'm not quite sure if I actually fully grasped what he meant, but um, I do certainly do today. So let's explore further. Many view engineering as solving problems and simply the application of science to practical ends for the benefit of humankind. Professional engineering in this definition highlights the responsibility to society and the public at large. The key terms in this definition highlights the value of engineering as a profession and ensures that engineering principles is not to be practiced for malicious purposes. This is all great, but what does the benefit of humankind mean? What does it imply? How does this phrase impact the solutions we design as engineers? Let's explore this a bit further. Engineers often use the natural word to inspire their designs. In fact, there is a term, not sure if you've heard it, biomimicry. It was coined to refer to learning from um, nature and adapting nature's best ideas to solving human technological challenges. Let's look at some examples. Let's look at, for example, the fast bullet trains in Japan. Uh, these trains were initially getting super fast and um, their typical bullet shape was causing a loud booming sound every time that they were exiting the typical train tunnel. One of the engineers on the team that was trying to solve this problem was a bird watcher. So he had witnessed a kingfisher bird diving down through the air, going into the water and creating a very little splash. He decided to apply this principle and the shape of the front of the, and modify the shape of the front of the bullet train. Um, and when they tried it, the trains were going as fast without creating the booming sound. This example and many others similar to that um, highlights the concept a function. And this function is the common concept between biology and human design. In order to be inspired by the natural world to solve our problems, we need to understand the concept of function and how it relates to biology and engineering design. Let's look at an example together. What do you think the link is between these two pictures. Many of you already know the answer because this is one of the great examples or stories about engineering mindset. But let's give everyone two minutes to kind of try to figure out the link between the two pictures. We'll give it till six and <laughs> all right. So what you just did was the beginning of the history of Velcro. Velcro comes from um, the French words velour, meaning velvet, and crochet, meaning hook. And it was invented in 1948 by a Swiss engineer when he noticed um, these uh, pricky seed burrs like sticking onto his dog after they came back from a walk. He looked at one of them under the microscope and see hooked, um, grasped on the fur 
and decided to copy the whole idea and create his own bulk route. Now, in this example, you see that there wasn't necessarily a need for Velcro that resulted in um, its invention, but rather it was a curiosity that was later used in a variety of applications, including, um, I put one here for your reference, the space travels. So there is technically no doubt that engineers can observe the natural world and come up with awesome solutions to mimic the functions in nature. But I think we can all agree that not all cool solutions engineers come up with are good solutions. Traditionally, the way that we design our solutions as engineers separates humans from their ecosystem. Consequently, we forget that we are part of the nature, not above it. There are so many examples. I was trying to come up with um, few of them that everybody can relate to at least one of them. Um, but again, I'm sure you can all think of one or two examples at a, at a minimum. But let's explore one of them, for instance. The heart engineering for the purpose of pro uh, protection, um, what we call hardening or heart armoring of the land water interface uh, against the sea. It has been proven to be quite ineffective over the years. Why is that? Well, today we know that not only they didn't necessarily address the active loss of land uh, to erosion, but they also resulted in ongoing passive erosions as a, as a result of like adjacent properties being basically exposed to more wave function. And um, we also have observed um, substantial damages to city infrastructure when the disaster is so strong that it can demolish these structures. In addition to all that, we know that hardening the, sh hardening the shorelines results in disruption of natural processes. It causes loss of biodiversity, and it in fact has reduced our resiliency to climate change. When we view the benefits to humankind in isolation and progressively try to master nature, we reduce the ecosystem integrity and cause more complex issues, such as the climate change, which we can all agree that is no benefit to humankind after all. So how can we adjust the engineering mindset to address this problem? Perhaps rethinking people's relationship with the environment is the basis for a mindset shift and consequently a, a sustainable effort towards um, human-centric crisis like the accelerated rate of climate change, for example. Our modern consumer heavy perception towards nature and natural resources and other species must recognize that ecosystems um, are not there to serve us. We have to learn to live in harmony with our ecosystem, but not to merely exploit it. It is also important to remember while nature is a great Nature is awesome in content. It is much, much better in context. What does this mean? It means that while we as engineers are making great progress towards integrating or reintroducing greeneries and green things into our built environment, we must also consider ways that we can leverage the elements of biodiversity for the greater good. Let's elaborate further on that in context of an example. I'm sure many of you are familiar with green roofs, which are essentially a rooftop green garden system. 
some of you might might also know about blue roofs that are rooftop water storage systems. We also increasingly see hybrid options like the one I'm illustrating here that kind of brings together green roofs and blue roofs idea. While the comparison between blue roofs and hybrid option uh, is kind of like comparing apples and oranges, I thought we can potentially make a point about that whole connection to nature here. The choice between blue roof and green roof should be basically primarily driven by the climate, the number of annual rainfall events, for example, or even bu building orientation, the location of the building, some other factors like jurisdictional requirements, um, budget for the project. So um, there is, however, an aspect that plays a big role, and that is public appetite for these different types of solutions. Sometimes this means how the increase by diversity that is a co-benefit of green roofs is perceived by the owners or investors. Are they for or against more bird species, for example, on the rooftop? What are some of the consequences that has to be considered during the design process? How is the mindset shift possible for engineers? What if we consider a transdisciplinary engineering mindset? We already know that engineering is the application of science, but why is it that we often forget to include scientific methods in our engineering design processes? Most specifically, when it pertains to natural environment and the science of living organisms. How can this approach look like in our engineering practices given our established engineering design processes? The key, in my opinion, is to understand the ecosystem is the basis of our analysis, not an afterthought. In other words, we cannot design to retrofit or fix later. In terms of climate change contribution, for example, the overall footprint attributed to products and services can be mitigated if true value is per, um, a, a, a true evaluation is performed during early stages of planning process. This is currently only a requirement in just a few sectors in Canada, not all. Perhaps by shifting the way we as engineers think about complex systems, we can create more impactful changes. I don't know if there is anybody in the crowd that's familiar with system analysis, but if you are, you know about the leveraging points. Technically, like essentially leveraging points are uh, places within a complex system, like a city or an ecosystem or in like a product, where a small shift in one section uh, can produce big changes overall. Shifting the paradigm for dealing, change, dealing with challenges or engineering problems is the most effective shift we can make, yet it is toughest to access on a practice level. For example, to make it a bit more tangible, think about the example of um, carbon emissions um, and think about two different strategies. We either change the fuel type or the source of energy in personal vehicles or we dig deeper and look at how personal vehicles are made and what infrastructure or business models need to be in place to reduce dependency on vehicles overall. How can we as engineers work towards achieving this shift? Because obviously we can't change the entire system. 
but perhaps we can invest in modern, um, basically redefining the solution from the grounds up, as opposed to just working on modern ways to perform our old solutions. And realizing that our own worldview of the universe is tremendously limited, no matter what stage of our career we are in. If we manage to do that at a practice level, we can count on our ecosystem to provide us with services that are beneficial not only to humankind, but to all living things on earth. Let's look at this mindset adjustment um, in context of an example. But remember yet again, that generally this topic and the decisions we make as engineers are not black and white. There are, as a lot of you know, dependent on an array of different factors. But just to elaborate more, we'll look at adhesion as a desirable function. Consider these inventions. On the left, you see muscle-inspired glue. It's a synthetic po polymer based on the strong attachment of muscles to rock surfaces. The bissel threads um, and some other proteins inside the muscle uh, enables them to create an adhesive that allows them to stick together even underwater. So some researchers have managed to mimic this bis bissel threads and uh, created a synthetic polymer as a glue, basically, um, that works underwater and it is pretty non-toxic as well. So it's a very cool invention. There are also adhesive um, uh, solutions that are invaded, be, uh, invented based on Gecko's um, physiology. Gecko's physiology is remarkable. It um, enables them to adhere to a variety of surfaces and move in whatever orientation they want, whether it's a smooth, rough, uh, wet, dry, clean, dirty, whatever. And it is all in the toe pads. Um, and uh, their toe pads are basically covered in millions of a small hair-like protection that um, branches further into like hundreds of nanoscale structures that um, basically are like tiny disks at the end. And it gives them um, basically a very high surface area um, and allows them to basically have even distribution uh, of forces when they stiffen their feet and basically they can use that physiology to stick to surfaces effortlessly. So between these two uh, inventions, we're gonna consider some questions. First of all, in many applications, we automatically translate adhesion to gluing things together. Are there any opportunities that we can adhere surfaces but not glue them? And if there are, what would this impact? Can this, for example, increase the rate of recycling and consequently reduce our waste generation? In fact, Ford, um, which is an automotive company, has uh, introduced a mechanism based on what I just explained to you in terms of the function of the gecko that allows the surface adhesion without using glue in the automat uh, automotive manufacturing processes. So this has allowed them to completely disassemble the plastic parts and basically recycle them or reuse them um, if they are in good condition. But some of you might think, well, this is going to be a lot of nanotechnology type thing. So would the financial gain from recycling all these new materials overweigh the cost of 
this nanoscale technology development? And also, is this whole recycling thing the only benefit? Or can you think of other benefits that um, comes from this easy removal of adhered surfaces? Just a few minutes for you to reflect on some of these questions before we move on to some of the known challenges. Okay. So, so far we know that it's possible to not only get inspirations from the natural world, but also integrate it into our engineering solutions. But obviously that requires a great deal of critical thinking. So what are we doing in our education system or in our daily lives and society to encourage critical thinking? Are we doing enough? Additionally, as a lot of you might basically bring this up, is uh, the question of cost. Obviously, living in a healthy ecosystem comes at a price. And the traditional economy, which we are in today, views um, basically everything as a continuous flow of revenue. In this traditional system, we as engineers have no choice but to translate the value of the ecosystem in terms um, that people with money and therefore power to make decisions or influence decisions can understand. So the challenge is to find ways to translate the positive benefits of the ecosystem or on the ecosystem and other species into monetary values. That is not only difficult, but it's also a controversial topic for a lot of people. Many believe we are not supposed to put a price on nature. And this begs the question, is this merely an engineering problem or is this a policy issue? How can engineers impact policy or decision-making at that level? So as you can see, these are very complex conversations, but we can perhaps start by a few baby steps. In general, we as engineers um, love to make assumptions. In fact, it is what helps us build solutions. But in this case, we can perhaps keep an open mind and find ways to facilitate this transition. There are many frameworks that we can leverage to kind of help us towards this goal. For example, the UN SDGs provide many useful building blocks for a sustainable society. Two of my most favorite are the partnerships and uh, quality education. And I think everything else from there kind of falls into place. But how can we employ these values to solve complex problems? For me, over the past year, this has translated into creating a climate literacy program. I've developed a program that fully engages my engineering approach to problem solving and basically brings together all the elements we just talked about 
from redefining the problem from the start and asking the right questions to ecosystem strategies and um, solving the core problem um, as well as impacts of climate change. And also a huge portion of it is leveraging meaningful engagements and partnerships. I want to encourage you to take a moment and consider the ways that you can integrate a transdisciplinary engineering mindset in your work today. And before we wrap up, let's summarize some of the main points we discussed. Our conversation about inspirations from natural world and the nature-based solutions are very human-centric. To detach nature from economic reasoning is to imply that we consider ourselves to be external to nature, which we already know is not true. The fault is not putting value on nature but I think it lies in the way that we have chosen to practice it. The second point was that resilience is integral to early planning. The overall footprint can be reduced massively if we consider evaluation as part of the planning uh, or early stages of our engineering design process. It should not be an afterthought. Also, we know to make a real impact, we must focus on redefining our solutions, asking the correct question, not just finding new ways to perform that same old solution. And lastly, I think we should highlight the need for making nature an integral part of education. Introducing an appreciation for natural world and natural ecosystem through education is essential in any society because at the end of the day, the burden of health, resilience, it all ultimately falls on individuals. If education system uh, introduces the concept from early ages, many will not grow as disconnected to nature that they do today. And that may be the key to an ecological approach in engineering problem solving. Thank you for participating. Uh, I think we have a lot of time for a Q&A, but before that, I wanted to acknowledge the um, uh, leader partners and allies and community um, supporters uh, that make this possible for us to get together today. So, Ms. Lina, I think we are um, good to start the Q&A. Perfect. Uh, I see some stuff in the chat, so. Ah, oh, I see. Okay. Thank you, Beth. <laughs> Perhaps I can stop share. I hope you put down my email address. You can always find me on LinkedIn. Not so much Twitter, but there's something out there. <laughs> okay. If there are not any questions,
Thank you, Jason. Okay, so um, I think Ms. Lina perhaps will be are wrapping up much earlier than planned. <laughs> no problem, Vivek. Thanks for joining.